Uh, we've been sharing this. Uh, this is my, my bow. It's pretty fancy. Um, Pastor Keon Henderson sent it to me as a gift. And so I used to have a bow from, um, from the, the little sports store, but now I got a real bow. This is a, this is a real bow. And uh, I've been practicing. So lift your hands if you want to receive a fresh impartation. Uh, so so the, the prophet tells him, he says, hey man, hey man, I need you to get a bow. He tells him, get a bow. This is all in 2 Kings chapter 13, all right? He says, get a bow and, and get some arrows, right? Plural, some arrows. Then he says, open the window. Ladies and gentlemen, I am begging thee, please go and look at the messages um, over the series. It's all uh, messages that I believe will really help change your life. Well, that was Travis Green, singer, songwriter, and founding pastor and overseer of Forward City Church in Columbia, South Carolina, begging people to go and listen to his past messages because, well, they're just that good. Hello, Bezel T3. Forward City Church was founded by Travis and his wife Jackie in 2016, and it grew steadily from there. In 2022, Forward City Church finished transforming an old Best Buy electronics store into this 45,000 square foot, 800 seat theater style worship experience center. Now, notice that Travis is holding a book by his good friend, Michael Todd. Now, we've done some videos on Michael Todd, and he better be his good friend because Michael used $1 million of Transformation Church's money to give to Travis and his church, I guess because he's that good. So on behalf of Transformation Church and everybody here, Forward City Transformation Church wants to give its single largest gift to another church of one million dollars. Well, okay. Travis Montorius Green, now you gotta love that middle name, is big. I mean, he's, well, a rock star of sorts. Having written, produced, and performed a boatload of music and received numerous music awards, Travis has an enormous following. His, his personal YouTube channel, which I think is the same as the Forward City Church channel, where all these sermons can be found, has one million subscribers. That's no joke. He put out a song at the end of 2023 called Strike the Ground. I will strike the ground. Oh, oh. Yeah, kind of catchy. Now, naturally, he's doing a sermon series with the same name. And that's where we're going to look today. I believe this particular sermon was from, well, the end of 2023, maybe November or so. And he begins by reading Isaiah 49, verses 2 and 3. Uh, Isaiah 49, some Old Testament in you today. Verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will display my splendor. Lord Jesus. Okay, then Travis prays and reintroduces the series for those who may be just tuning in. Uh, We've been in a series. I'm kidding called Strike the Ground. And uh, it's been primarily out of 2 Kings chapter 13, which is a story about this king, King uh, Jehoaz, who comes to the deathbed of the prophet Elisha. He races to him, uh, and he's both scared and sad. He's sad because Elisha, his mentor, is dying, Mm -hmm. and he's scared because he's about to face the battle. Uh, But as as he weeps over Elisha, Elisha redirects his focus from a pity partner into partnering with what God desires to do in faith through his life. Elisha turns his focus to a prophetic instruction. 
All right. So the major text in this series is 2 Kings 13 because it says strike the ground. But the text for this day actually is Isaiah 49. Both mention a bow and arrow. Then he grabs the bow and the arrow, as you saw in the intro, and we'll pick it up after that. So he, he launches the arrow out the window, and then the, the prophet tells him, he gives him instruction. He says, strike the ground. And the Bible says the king strikes the ground three times. The prophet is so upset. He is so mad because he tells him, man, you should have did it at least five or six times and you would have completely wiped out the enemy. But your faith capacity was only for three times. Here's what I believe as I dug into it. That the reason why the prophet was so upset is because perhaps the, ki the king still had arrows left in his quiver, right? And so he's like, man, you should have you should have emptied the clip. You should have went all the way. He could go all the way. You should have completely did everything that you could in faith. But here's what I discovered. The reason, I need you to catch this. The reason he could not go all the way with the arrows in his quiver is because this was a reflection of an internal battle he was losing. Mm. Okay, so that we don't lose what happened in this account. King Joash, it could be said either way, was not told to shoot all his arrows or empty his clip, as Travis says. Elisha told him to shoot an arrow out the window and then strike the ground with the other arrows in his quiver. He was not told how many times. But Elisha was not satisfied with the three times the king struck the ground, rather that the king display strength and boldness in battle by many strikes. Travis then goes psychological on King Joash and, and says he had an internal battle and harkens back to verse 11 and the very familiar phrase we find over and over again with the kings of Israel, and it's true, he also did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. But before Travis can explain this battle, he must first battle with the ineptness of his live stream crew. The Bible gives us insight into this real battle. It's found earlier in chapter 13 and verse 11. Read it with me. It says, but he did what was evil. He did what was evil, verse 11. He did what was evil in the Lord's eyes. He said, and he refused to turn from the sins of Jeroboam. He refused to turn from the sins of his father. He refused. Come on, guys, media. I believe in you. I know you can find it. It's verse 11. Oh, nothing like a little pressure, right, on the media crew to whip them into shape. You have verse 10, just go one up. There you go. Come on, get, let's give them a hand. They are splendid and perfect in all of their ways. Oh, how condescending. That's horrible. All right, now that the live stream crew is back on track, we can continue. Travis will talk about the king refusing to turn from idols and the fact that we have the very same problem today. It says he refused to turn from the sins of his fathers. In other words, he refused to turn from idols. When temptation comes knocking at your door, you're not the only one. I'm so sick of believers acting like you're the only one that got to fight. It's so hard. Everybody fighting. You ain't the only one that got to fight lust. Everybody nasty. Come on, come on, come on. Let's come on. I know you're a bishop, but you still got another side. If you're given the right opportunity, it's going down. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Come on, man. You won right opportunity. You won chocolate factory. I ain't scared of y'all. I came to help all of us. That's why I have accountability. Travis don't trust Travis. I'm the first preacher that's going to make a public announcement. I don't trust myself. All right, now that's good to know and extra credit for your transparency, Travis. But since the text is not about you, um, let's say we get back to 2 Kings 13, or even better, Isaiah 49, that you began with. The king shows up nervous about an external fight, but ignoring the internal fight. And I know there's an internal fight, hear me, because the arrows that remain in his quiver represented the idols that remained in his house. Write this down. Your external strike will always be 
subject to your internal strike. All right, now, I don't have a pen and paper. Mm. Well, did you write it down? You know, external strike and then um, external strike. But wait a minute, wasn't it about the times the king struck the ground with the arrows and not the number of arrows he struck the ground with? Anyway, Travis is heading somewhere, obviously, and it's about hiding idols that keep you from complete obedience. So, but strike down any and everything that is idolatry. What the revelation is, is wherever you find an idol, kill it. And kill it fast, right? And so you lack complete obedience in any area of your life. Wherever you lack complete obedience in any area of your life. Wherever you lack complete obedience in any area of your life, an idol is hiding. Oh, oh, oh. Let that marinate. Oh, some of y'all country folks got your food at home marinating, getting ready. You can taste it right now, can't you? Just uh-huh. let this marinate. <laughs> All right, wait a minute. Complete obedience? I mean, have you or I ever displayed complete, perfect obedience for, whoa, for a one day or even an hour or maybe just a minute or two? Now, idols aside for a moment, you and I have a sin problem. Yes, even as Christians, we have a sin problem. And if we could perform complete, perfect obedience by ridding ourselves of all idols, then we wouldn't need a savior. Uh, we, we wouldn't need a savior, now would we? <laughs> Travis is going to try and bail us out from our idol problem, and he's going to do it by now going to Isaiah 49. An idol is anyone or anything that has the ability to talk you out of complete obedience to God. What is standing in your way of obedience? Ladies and gentlemen, it's an idol. But I love this scripture, and I read it earlier, and I felt some prophetic declarations that I hope you catch, and we about to strike the ground. Are you ready? Isaiah 49. Okay, a prophetic uh, declaration coming. Now, he read it earlier, uh, uh, Isaiah 49. Now, it's one of the great uh, passages in Isaiah's prophecy that are called the servant songs. And let's see what Travis does with this one. Travis reads beginning in verse 2. That's odd. So let's start uh, from verse 1. We read there, Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hands, he hid me. Number one, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. The first thing I want you to write down, God's about to sharpen your words. In case you didn't know, your mouth is a weapon. All right, why not start from the beginning of the chapter? I mean, verse 1, which he ignored, speaks of the servant calling out to the coastlands to hear him, to listen. And the coastlands were those places far away. We could even say the uttermost parts of the earth. I mean, Isaiah is referring to someone, God's servant, who was called by God from the body of his mother. You know, it kind of makes me think of that line from the ancient creed, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and um, he became incarnate by the Holy Spirit uh, and the Virgin Mary and was made human. But Travis, like so many big box preacher these days, wants to make it about us. Your declaration is about to kill something once and for all. Your mouth is a weapon. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 18, I had to collab two different translations so you really understand what it's saying. No. But it says, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind or, or what this means is forbid, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Here and whatever it comes. you loose or permit, allow on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I don't have time to really work this, but can I tell you, there are some things in your life that are waiting for you to get enough faith to speak them into existence. And if you can't speak things that are not into things that are, well, sorry, that's on you, O person of little faith. Not quite the point here. 
For one thing, Matthew 18, 18 is a specific kind of binding and loosing. It's the parallel passage of Matthew 16, 19, and it has to do with extending or withholding the keys to the kingdom. Now, here in Matthew 18, either by the gospel or through church discipline. But this is where Travis is lifting up his skirt and exposing his unbiblical law of attraction tendencies. Don't believe me? Watch this. Come on, y'all not ready for what I'll be praying for. And I'm not even, I'm not a prosperity guy. That's not my thing, right? I believe you can be blessed and don't have much. That's why I go to Africa every single year to some of the most impoverished places on the planet. And I preach the same gospel to them. So I don't think God loves you more if you have more. I love you less if you have less. I don't believe any of that. But I do believe. But the thing is, prosperity preachers like Ken Copeland, Benny Hinn, Jesse Duplantis, they all go to Africa too. And they preach the same gospel. I mean... Here's Travis's house, okay, which is, which is, well, tiny in comparison to Ken Copeland's house. And that makes me wonder, why couldn't Travis speak a bigger house into existence? I mean, he talks as though he could have. You have the ability, and this is in the Word of God, to speak those things that are not as though they are. So my wife and I would drive around neighborhoods where we couldn't afford a blade of grass, and we would just claim. I'm talking about we would just drive around, don't even belong, hoping we'll get kicked out. Just... One day we're going to have, how you want your, you want brick, baby? Cool. You want, what you want in the backyard? You want a pool? Cool. Well, that mean the boys need to get swim lessons. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You want, what, what you want? I need at least a three-car garage. I know we only got one working car, but I see something in my future. You got to start getting yourself prepared and ready. I will walk in rooms and know I wasn't qualified and have my head up like, yep, yeah, I belong here. Y'all don't know me yet, but you will. You might want to get to know me, Mr. Kurt Franklin, because sooner or later, God's about to bring my name up. I need you to hop up your neighbor and tell him, get your yourself ready and speak the future until it becomes the present. You know, I'm really struggling to find the law of attraction being taught anywhere in Isaiah 49. But maybe, just maybe, you know, I'm I, I'm not looking hard enough. I don't know. You got to tell somebody, you got to get a little bolder. I love it. And some of y'all are like, well, what if it don't happen? It won't if you stay quiet. You got 10 seconds to praise God like he's about to launch you into a new dimension. I said he's about to launch you. He's going to sharpen your word. He's going to sharpen your word. He had my mouth like a sharpened sword. Here's the next part. Verse 2, put it up. He had my mouth like a sharpened sword. Isaiah 49, 2. Then it says, in the shadow of of his hand, he hid me. <clears throat> this ain't for everybody. But God did show me a few of y'all faces as I was praying. Since we're in a corporate setting, you might as well catch this. The Lord told me to tell you, your hiding days are over. I got it. Your hiding days are over. Did he just over. say my God? I think he did. God's about to call your name, David, from the back of the line to the front of the line. Your hiding days are over. You've been hidden for a season. You've been hidden for a purpose. But God's about to bring you out of darkness into the light. Tell your neighbor it's time to step out. You know, could it be, could it be that Travis is just making this stuff up? I mean, it's not easy to butcher this text as badly as Travis is managing to do. I mean, it doesn't just happen. You really, really have to work at it. Isaiah 49 is part of the Old Testament, right? And what did Jesus say after his resurrection to those two disciples he was walking with on the road to Emmaus? He said, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should, sh should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then Luke continues, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, including Isaiah, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, sometimes Jesus is not the central character in each and every Old Testament passage, but he is the central character of the redemptive historical movie of the Old Testament, if you will. And this passage, well, it's hard to miss Jesus in this passage. Like I'm saying, you gotta try. But before we get there ourselves, let's see where Travis goes with this. 
And spoiler alert, get ready to go further and faster. I ain't have nothing. Y'all, there was a time <laughs> where people who knew my wife thought that I was dating her only because she was about to be a dentist. I was like, Jackie, he just with you. He just with you for your, the money you about to make. My wife went to school for eight years and worked eight months. Because the people didn't know that I was just in a pullback season. That God was about to launch me to a dimension where my wife can choose to work. You don't hear what I'm telling you. High five your neighbor and tell him I'm about to go up. God's about to show up through me. God's about to show up through me. I haven't seen that. Ears haven't heard. When I play this idol, God's about to launch me. I am his arrow. You got 15 seconds in time to lift your hands, lift your voice, and praise him like God's about to launch you. Further, faster, further, faster, further, faster, further, faster. Further and faster. Further, faster, further, faster, further, faster, further, faster, further, faster, further, faster, further, faster. Further and faster. Further, faster, further, faster, further, faster. Don't judge me too fast. God's about to launch me. Somebody about faith, just do it, just do it. He's pulling me back. He's pulling me back. He's pulling me back. He's pulling me back. It may feel like I'm losing this season, but he's just pulling me back. It may feel like I'm going under in this season, but he's just oh, pulling me back. Oh, that's a big stretch, my shoulder. He's pulling me back to launch me. <sighs> okay. That's exhausting. You know, a nap after this is probably in order. <laughs> so I'll tell you what. Let's get in our own pullback season here without the bow and the arrow and take a fresh look at Isaiah chapter 49. Now, a pretty basic fact that every preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ should know is that there are four amazing servant songs in Isaiah that point unmistakably to Christ Jesus. The first one is Isaiah 42, which begins, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. God's people were often being prosecuted by the prophets for not doing what's right, for not protecting widows or orphans or the poor. But this servant of God will care for those who are just hanging on by a thread, the kinds of people who are the bruised reeds and the smoldering wicks. We see this in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Then there is Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backwards. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and from spitting. Though Jesus knew he was on the road to immense suffering, both physically and spiritually, he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. And of course, the most well-known servant song, Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, the servant, the iniquity of us all. Now, this last servant song brings together all of what the servant will achieve through his suffering and ultimate death and resurrection. Jesus was brutally beaten. He was wounded for all the sins of those for whom he would die. His suffering and death would result in the salvation and the sprinkling, the, the liberal sprinkling of God's grace in all the nations as the New Testament church began to spread like wildfire. Satan could no longer contain the spread of the gospel. 
And this is exactly what is being conveyed symbolically, in my opinion, uh, that we find in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, and also in Luke 10, 18. But the servant song in question today is Isaiah 49, which Travis, for his eisegetical purposes, right, not, not exegetical, but eisegetical purposes, only use verses 2 and 3. But actually, as we saw before, it begins in verse 1, this way as the servant himself speaks. I tell you again, he says, listen to me, coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. You know, another, another way of saying this is, listen all you, even those who are at the very ends of the earth. Where else do we hear those words? Well, in Acts 1 verse 8, when Jesus says to the disciples right before he ascends to heaven, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Verse 1 of Isaiah 49 continues by saying, the Lord called me from the womb. And even way before that, as we see from Micah 5.2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephathra, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. For the body of my mother, he from, I should say, the body of my mother, he named me. Now we see this come to pass in Luke one. Verse 31, where Mary was told by the angel Gabriel that her son was to be named Jesus. You know, God saves. Verse 2 of Isaiah 49, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. You see, the power and authority of this servant, who we know now to be Jesus, would not be the earthly weapons of swords or bow and arrow, but rather the very words he speaks. I mean, think of John 6.33. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And again, to the symbolism of Revelation, now uh, chapter 1, verse 16, where the image of the Lord Jesus, we see his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters, and in his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And we see the same picture in chapter 19 of Revelation. Okay, verse 2 continues in, um, in, in Isaiah 49. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. And I think the point, um, the, the point of this is that it shows us the years of preparation of Messiah as he lived in obedience with his earthly parents in virtual obscurity, waiting for the time when his ministry would begin in earnest. As in Luke 2.52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in faith, favor with God and man. And then verse 3 of Isaiah 49, And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. The servant is called Israel, but it, he is the true Israel. So could you really say that this means that the Jewish nation, uh, you know, the, the, the Jewish nation is the servant, as most modern Jews would say? Well, no, because in verses 5 and 6 of this chapter, the servant's job is to return the nation of Israel back to God. Verse 5, and now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob, Israel, back to him, and even the more in, incredibly in, ultimate task of bringing all the nations back to proper worship of God. And then verse 6, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And this is clearly seen in the Revelation of John, where we read in chapter 7, verse 9, after this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. This is what Isaiah 49 is pointing to, quite easily understood through, look, by, by looking through the lens of the New Testament. 
But not only does Travis miss the essence of Isaiah chapter 49, but then, sadly, he launches into a giving jag and his own extravagant giving. This is the New Testament version of striking the ground. <laughs> it's both destroying an idol and it's laying something as a gift at the feet of Jesus. I've been praying about if I should even share the amount that I'm giving because I never do that. I never share. I'm just kind of, I believe the Bible is like, you know, don't, don't boast about it. But I don't know. I've been wrestling if I should share. He's going to share. Believe me, he's going to. He can't help himself. I mean, come on. Um, but we're, we're giving extravagantly this year. Um, I, I mean, this on this gift. Next year, I will share this. Give it up. That next year, we've been, our church has existed for seven years. Next year, my wife and I will break over having contributed to this church over a million dollars in seven years. Seven years. We don't, we, don't, we don't play around. We give for real. So I dare not ask you to do something that we're not leading the way with. One of my biggest prayers is that I don't want us to be the number one givers in this church. We've held that title for too long. I want, I'm like, God, you need to send some more ballers up in here. <laughs> Oh, man. Isn't that what every church needs? Some more ballers up in here? Because Travis is tired of being the number one baller at his own Forward City Church. I mean... Come on, man. So we're going to start over here with the West Side. We're going to start over here. And um, I want y'all to come up and strike your ground. And we're going to celebrate. And this is what I want you guys to do. Hey, 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 hey. I've decided. I've decided. Oh, come on, come on. I'm done. I'm done. Strike the crowd. So here's the upshot of both 2 Kings 13 and Isaiah 49, uh, according to Travis Green. It's to destroy the idols in your life so you can come to complete and perfect obedience and also lay a gift at the feet of Jesus by slapping your offering at the white tennis shoe clad feet of Travis Green as he struts around on the stage. I do have to wonder though, was God actually pleased with this sermon, with its law of attraction, speaking things into existence nonsense, and all the subsequent slapping of the strike cards on the platform. <clears throat> I think not. It makes me think of Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7. When Christ came into this world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. But then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Hebrews, wow, amazing. Now go back to the third servant song, okay, the one we didn't look at so, so deeply. And what do we see? Well, Isaiah 50, verse 5, The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backwards. You see, unlike sinful mankind, including you and me, who did not hear, whose ears were not opened, who were treacherous and rebellious from the womb, Jesus was always obedient to the will of his Father. In John 17, 4, Jesus says these incredible words, I have glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. You see, the Lord Jesus, he never looked back. Through a faith perfected from all his life on earth, he set his face towards Jerusalem like flint. And instead of striking the ground, those who would crucify the Lord of life would strike the Lord himself, as we see in Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. It was through the ignominious and torturous suffering of the Lord Jesus by the very people he created in his image that God's true glory is most fully 
manifested. It's most fully comprehended. If you can say by faith that Jesus did all that for me, you know, in, in, in Latin, pro ma, a sinner, then brother or sister, you are part of that vast company of God's people that comprise both Jew and Gentile. For God the Father says to his servant Jesus in Isaiah 49, verse 6, slightly paraphrased in light of the New Testament revelation, it is too light a thing that you should only bring back the remnant of Israel. We have bigger plans. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And that includes you and me, if only in Jesus and his cross we place our hope.